Corinthians chapter 15. This is, this is uh, what's called the resurrection chapter by most people, and there's a reason for that. And we'll get into that here shortly. You know, why? Uh, he, makes a, he does a lot of explanation on the resurrection here. <clears throat> In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which you also received and which also you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preach to you unless you believed in vain. So Paul tells them that the good news that he gave them is that they're saved if they hold fast to these words that he told them. What, what are the words to hold fast to? You know, if Paul's staying true to his ways, he's paraphrasing scripture. In Proverbs 3, verses 1 and 2, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For the length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. In Proverbs 6, starting at verse 20, My son, observe the commandment of your father. Do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they'll guide you. When you sleep, they'll watch over you. When you awake, they'll talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light and reproofs for discipline are a way of life. Well, until you start following Torah, you never know what this is about. That passage right there. But here in 1 Corinthians, he, right away, he says, I want you to hold fast to the word that I preached to you, which is a paraphrase of what we just read right here in Proverbs. Paul says, uh, unless you believed in vain... Now, I thought this was a curious statement until I read further into this chapter. Paul says, if we do not entrust in and commit to the resurrection of Yeshua, our attempts at faithfulness are in vain. And that's evident down in verses 12 and 13, and we'll get there. <clears throat> Verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, Messiah died for the sins of man according to the Scriptures. This was prophesied in a lot of places in the Tanakh, Genesis 3.15, all of Psalm 22, all of Psalm 69, Isaiah 53, um, Daniel, 24 verse, or Daniel 9, verses 24 through 26, other places too, but a lot of places. And that's what Paul's referring to. Verse 4, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So there are several references in scripture in the Tanakh that he would die and be buried and he wouldn't stay there. In Psalm 16, verses 11, 10 and 11, For you will not abandon my soul to the grave, neither will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. In the right hand there are pleasures forever. In Isaiah 53, starting at verse 10, but Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will prosper in his hand. <coughs> Excuse me. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he'll divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, no, well, it, really, I looked up that Hebrew word in the past. I don't remember what it is, but it is more like pleased because of the sin that he, that he bore. It was to punish the sin. You see, that's why it, it, it pleased him in his righteousness. Yeah. 
Yeah, he was pleased with what was happening. With, with the sins of his people being taken care of. <clears throat> Hosea 6, verse 2, he'll revise, uh, revive us after two days. He'll raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Well, that's a pretty bold statement there. <clears throat> and Jonah 1, 17, and Yahweh appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Um, well, yeah, and Messiah said he'll be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights, but how did, how is this point to a resurrection? Well, the fact of the matter is, uh, how many of y'all have spent three days and three nights inside a whale or fish? Anybody besides me? Well, what you do is you die, okay? And then when you get spit back up on the land, you, it's, it's called coming back to life. That's what happened with Jonah. He didn't sit in the belly of that whale or fish for three days and three nights praying the Lord's Prayer or whatever. Uh, the description in Jonah is pretty vivid. It, it describes him dying in there. So that's, that's why this is, is good, and it's a picture of Messiah. Yes. Oxygen deprivation, that's what he's going through. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, exactly. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, And he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Interesting verse. Uh, he appears to Cephas, who was a disi disciple, then to the twelve. Well, who are the twelve? It can't be a reference to the disciples because there were only 11 disciples after the resurrection. Who's Peter? Uh, I've heard this to be a contradiction, but it's not. Yeshua appeared to Peter first after the resurrection. Then he appeared to all the disciples, as we're told in John chapter 20. And the reference to the 12 was still a reference to the disciples. In John 20, verse 24, but Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Yeshua came. So one of the twelve was just a reference to the disciples, okay, or the twelve. Verse 6, 1 Corinthians 15. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Now we don't know that much about when he appeared to 500 at one time, but it may have been just before his ascension. Verse 7, then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Um, we don't know when he appeared to James either. But we do know that he stayed with them 40 days before he ascended and went to the Father. That's in Acts 1, verse 3. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of Elohim. Verse 8, and last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So Yeshua appeared to Paul on that road to Damascus. He speaks of his own experience with Messiah as a premature birth. He probably is comparing Messiah's appearance to him as a premature appearance before he returns. Verses 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the assembly of Elohim. But by the grace of Elohim, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of Elohim with me. Now Paul knew that he was not fit to be called a real apostle for Elohim because of his past persecuting persecution of the assembly but by the grace of Elohim he was brought close to Elohim see Paul was not what was you saved because he was a good guy because he was a good person he wasn't and if you'll notice remember on that road to Damascus what happened he was blinded and how and what was the initial thing he got knocked off his 
donkey on, onto his backside. I see, I left the King James English out of that, but could have, could have said it twice. <clears throat> uh, okay, and it was there when he got knocked off his donkey, and he's on that road to Damascus, and he, and he was laying there in tears that he asked Jesus into his heart. You remember that part? Oh, you don't remember that part. Okay, but then how was he saved if he didn't do that? Well, I'll be. You people are disillusioning me. You know, he was made an apostle because of the graciousness of the Father. That's why he was chosen. We're looking at a guy here who says he persecuted the assembly. We're not so sure he didn't kill a lot of people. He wanted to. Paul wanted to kill a lot of people in the assembly. He burned with anger like that, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when they stoned Stephen. And they said, here, I'll hold your coat for you. Well, you go find some rocks and hit him in the head with it. You know, um, it, Paul was not a good guy. He was an evil man at one time. Well, what, was he, what did he do before he became a He persecuted the people of Yeshua. He was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. <clears throat> But it was just the grace of the Father. That's all it was. Verses 11 and 12. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now if Messiah is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Okay. Now we get into the reason for this chapter. There's a lot, many in Corinth who denied the resurrection, that it would happen. They denied it. Do you know Why? Because it was part of ancient Greek culture that there was no resurrection. The philosophy of the day denied that Jewish belief of a resurrection. The Greek thought, and I believe I have this printed up here. Yes, Greek thought generally denied a resurrection of the body from the dead. Aeschylus has Apollo say, when the dust hath drained the blood of a man, once he is slain, there is no resurrection. And as Aeschylus' play, uh, Agamemnon, a member of the chorus says, I know no way how by mere words to bring the dead back to life. Herodotus reports that uh, Prexispes told Cambyses, if the dead can rise, you may look to see Astyages, the Mede, rise up against you. But if nature's order had be not changed, assuredly no harm to you will arise from Smyrtus. And the chorus in Sophocles' Electra say, Yet him, your sire, from Acheron's dark, or dark shore, by prayers or cries thou canst restore, no, nevermore. Hmm. So you see, that was, uh, that was the Greek culture of the day. Now, uh, it's true that Aristotle mentions the possibility of a resurrection, and in that section that he does, he's actually speaking of a soul leaving a, and re-entering the body and going to other bodies also. That, that is highly unlikely to the Greek mind after the body decayed. So they believed not in a resurrection, but in an afterlife. That your, your ghost goes somewhere. Okay? So this Greek, Corinth was heavily, heavily influenced by the Greek culture. Okay, remember? Uh, is it okay if we have sex with temple prostitutes? Is that okay, Paul? Um, well, yeah, that, 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 that guy and his mother, they're, they're doing things they shouldn't do, but, um, you know, we just don't talk about it. Um, all kinds of, of divisions, fights. Um, when, they would, when they would meet, everybody would bring food. Uh, some guys would just go in there and eat it all first. Um, there were some people not getting enough attention. They wanted attention. They were petty. They wanted more honor. They wanted the attention, so they would get up and start babbling. And, I mean, the, the problems that they had. I mean, they were influenced by the Oracle of Delphi. They were influenced by the prostitutes at the temple. They were influenced by all these things. And they denied the resurrection of the dead because the Greek culture did. It didn't make sense to them. Well, no, he's decayed. He turned to dust. They're gone. 
You know, we've dug up graves before. Uh, there's nothing left. There's a skeleton there for a while, but not for long. It still decays too. Well, these things, if, if the assembly would accept some of these things, that would make the, the Corinth assembly more amiable to the people, okay? If you accept the things of the Greek culture. And that's what they were doing. They were accepting those things. It's in the same way Christianity does today. Okay? Let's accept the, the pagan things in, in societies and, and embrace them and say it's part of Christianity. You know, Sunday morning service, Easter, Christmas, Lent, Halloween, all these things. They're, they're a part of a pagan culture. But the Christian church just, just embraces them. Why? Because... Jesus loves you, and I love you, and you love me. And we want you to join us. And if we make this more comfortable for you, we'll do it your way. Change a few names, and everybody will be happier. Well, that's what Corinth was doing. That's what Christianity does today. <clears throat> so this letter here, how many things have we addressed with this letter? Has Paul addressed? Uh, the sexual immorality... Another ancient Greek thing. I think a modern Greek thing too. Speaking in a tongue, prophesying, resurrection, denying the resurrection. See, this letter serves the purpose to address all these issues. That's its purpose. Verses 13 and 14. So now he's going to go in and tell them why there's a resurrection and why it's true. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Messiah has been raised. And then, <coughs> excuse me. And if Messiah has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faithfulness also is in vain. Well, if there's no resurrection, then Messiah wasn't raised from the dead. If he wasn't resurrected, then the preaching and the faithfulness of the people's in vain. That's what he warned in verse 2 that we talked about. You've got to believe in the resurrection, that it's coming. Verse 15, moreover... We're even found to be false witnesses of Elohim because we witnessed against Elohim that he raised Messiah, whom he did not raise if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Messiah has been raised. Excuse me, and if Messiah has not been raised, your faith, faithfulness is worthless. And you're still in your sins. <clears throat> Paul's making the point that they're false witnesses if they do not profess the resurrection of Messiah. Paul insists that if the resurrection of the dead is not true, then Messiah did not resurrect from the dead. Paul once again states, if the resurrection is not true, our faithfulness and what we're doing is a waste of time. A complete waste of time. Verses 18 and 19. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Messiah have perished. For if we have hoped in Messiah in this life only... We are, of all men, most to be pitied. If our hope in Messiah is just for here, for this life, he says then we're, we, we're to be pitied more than anyone. Verse 20, but now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. It's a very, very important passage. Paul earlier spoke to the Corinthians about Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You remember that? That's in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8. Clean out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. Just as you are, in fact, unleavened, for Messiah, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Let us, therefore, celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and, and, and truth. He also talks about celebrating Passover in chapter 11. I'm not going to show it, but now he talks about Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You need to celebrate those things. Now what he's talking about is the Feast of First Fruits. When is the Feast of First Fruits? Anybody remember? I know Mark does. Uh, it's actually, it's in it. It's the first day after the Sabbath day within that week. That's the Feast of First Fruits. <clears throat> and we'll read about that here. Uh, 
Leviticus 23, starting at verse 10. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I'm going to give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the high priest. Then he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh for you to be accepted, and on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb one year old without defect for a burnt offering to Yahweh. Its grain offering shall then be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering by fire to Yahweh for a soothing aroma with its libation, a fourth of the hen of wine. Until this same day, until you have brought in the offering of your Elohim, you shall eat neither bread nor roasted grain nor new growth. It is to be a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. Okay, when is the Feast of First Fruits again? It's the, it's the day after the first Sabbath within the Feast of Unleavened Bread. When did Messiah resurrect? Hmm? The day after the Sabbath, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he resurrected on the day of first fruits. So, it has to take place in order. <clears throat> It has to take place in order. He first. But what did you do with the first fruits? What were they, who were they presented to? The Father has to be presented to the Father first. You take the first fruits of the harvest and you present it to the Father. That's the feast of first fruits. Look at what Messiah said. <clears throat> in Matthew 13, starting at verse 36, then he left the multitudes, went into the house. His disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. He answered and said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age. The harvest, this precedes, the first fruits precedes, precedes the harvest. Now, do you remember when Messiah resurrected? It was that day after the Sabbath. And Mary was there, and she tried to touch him. What did he say? Don't touch me because I've not yet ascended to the Father. He was not yet presented himself to the Father as the first fruits of the resurrection. Okay. Everything has to happen in his order. Okay? It has to happen in his order. <clears throat> He's the first fruits of that resurrection. Verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 15. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Messiah the first fruits, after that those who are Messiahs at his coming. So through one man, that being Adam, came death. Through one man, Yeshua, came the resurrection of the dead. Just as in, all, in Adam all died, in Messiah all will be made alive again. But it must take place in order. In the Feast of the first fruits, no grain or crops are allowed to be eaten until the first fruits are presented before Elohim. Messiah, the first fruits of the resurrection, must be resurrected. Then after that, those who are Messiahs at his coming. That's when the harvest happens. Verse 24. Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to Elohim and Father. When he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. So he'll abolish all rule and power except his own. The last enemy he'll abolish is death. Um, he's going to abolish all rule and all authority and power. You notice uh, it says when he returns in Revelation and other places, uh, the earth will shake and all the mountains and islands will fall. What do mountains represent again? Kingdoms. Islands. Just a mountain with water all around it. That's all it is. And that's what, that's what Paul's saying. That's what Paul's saying. 
Verse 27, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjected to him. This is a quote from Psalm 8, verse 6, to where, starting at verse 4, we read, What is man that you do take thought of him, and the son of man that you do take care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than Elohim, and do crown him with glory and majesty. You do make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That's a messianic psalm, speaking of the return of Messiah, by the way. Psalm 8 is. Verse 28, and when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, that Elohim may be all in all. All things will be subjected to Messiah, and Messiah will be subjected to the Father. Well, this is a doozy. Verse 29, otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Does someone want to explain that? Go ahead, Cliff. I saw your hand up. <laughs> okay, very, very difficult verse to understand. Keep in mind, Paul's speaking. What's he talking about in this chapter again? Resurrection. Okay? That's not changed. He didn't just say, time out here, I'm going to talk about baptizing dead people for a second, and then I'm going to hop back, and now we're going to talk about the resurrection again. No, 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 no. It's all the same thought. Keep that thought process going. This is where people really mess up with Paul's letters. He tries to get a thought process going, but people don't want to do that. They want to pluck a phrase out of what he's saying, slap it to the wall, and say, there, that's me. There, that's my denomination. There, that's my people, whatever it is. You are not under the law. There, you are not under the law. Those are my six words that I live by. There you go. That's not what Paul's letters are for, okay? Not at all. Keep this going here. <clears throat> um, he's speaking of the resurrection, not that one needs to be baptized after they die. By the way, this is why the Mormons uh, have baptisms for dead people. Is this passage right here? Yeah. That's it. They have baptisms for dead people. And they're big into the genealogy stuff. Uh, Ancestry.com has nothing on these people, on the Mormons. And, and the Ancestry thing, that's, that's cool. I mean, that's fine. But their reason being is, is a little different. Uh, I'm not going to go there but they have some strange wild and wonderful crazy beliefs so <clears throat> now the phrase reads otherwise what will those do who are baptized for the dead I just wanted to look at what the Greek words were here and see if there's an alternate way to translate one of them that would explain this um, <coughs> the word here for baptized for the dead uh, what about those who are baptized concerning the dead that changes this quite a bit. Otherwise, let's read it this way. Otherwise, what will those who are baptized who are baptized, what will those do who are baptized concerning the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized concerning them? Or look at it this way. If the dead will not raise, why get baptized if there's no resurrection? That's what he's saying. Why get baptized if there's no resurrection? Sometimes he has, Paul has a way of turning, you know, a simple phrase into a complicated long phrase. And he kind of did here. But that's what he means. Keeping with the theme, it's the resurrection. Why get baptized if you're just going to die and it's done? Okay? If the dead aren't raised at all, you know, why get baptized? Because we're all going to die. And we're done, right? <clears throat> Make sense? Why, why keep the Torah? Why keep, yeah. Right. Right. Why not thunk Tom on the head and steal his money? 
Well, because he carries a gun. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, several things. Forget about the, you know, when you die, your ghost goes up to heaven or down to hell. That's not true. That's not scriptural, okay? That's Dante's Inferno. Um, that's the movie Gladiator. It's not truth. It's not reality. It's not scripture. But there is a resurrection. You see, why would there even need to be a resurrection if you had this ghost that would float around and, you know, you could spy on people? Well, that'd be cooler than, you know, well, I don't want my body back. I kind of like this. I'm lightweight. <laughs> I can go up behind my brother and go, boom. <laughs> and then I can disappear. <laughs> that'd be a hoot. Let's admit it. So that's not, that's not true. It's just not true. Um, but the resurrection, now that's the thing. You see, Paul gets all excited about this resurrection thing. He said, Messiah proves the resurrection. He proves it. We're all going to be resurrected. All of his people are. It's exciting. We're going to have, we're going to have an immortal body. We're not going to have a body that falls apart like this one is. <clears throat> you young people, just wait. <laughs> You'll see. <clears throat> Am I on verse 30? I think so. Why are we also in danger every hour? I protest, I protest, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Messiah Yeshua, our master, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's true. Being in danger for teaching Messiah is a complete waste of time if there's no resurrection. Why be in danger for teaching Messiah if there's no resurrection? What's the purpose? While in Ephesus, Paul fought with wild beasts, nearly cost him his life. What good is that if there's no resurrection? Paul illustrates the futility of all things by quoting the description of the northern kingdom of Israel shortly before their destruction. That's in Isaiah 22, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, in that day, uh, the Adonai Yahweh of hosts called you to weeping, to wailing, to shaving the head and to wearing sackcloth. Instead, there's gaiety, gladness, killing of the cattle, slaughtering of the sheep, eating of meat, drinking of wine, saying, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we may die. Paul says, if there's no resurrection, the northern kingdom was right. But they're not. They weren't right. Verses 33 and 34. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of Elohim. I speak this to your shame. He tells the people to stop sinning. To their shame, there's some among them who don't know Elohim and don't know his Torah at all. Verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. Paul's giving an analogy here to describe the glorified, resurrected body. Seed sown in the earth dies as a seed. And what happens? The seed itself, as a seed, dies when it's planted. What comes out? Something much more magnificent than just the little seed. The plant comes out. The tree comes out. <clears throat> In the same way, at death, a body decomposes. At the resurrection, the glorified body will be similar to that body that it died, but it'll be magnified greatly. Verse 38, but Elohim gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. <clears throat> All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of man, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. 
But the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For stars, for star differs from star in glory. See, the seeds in the flesh vary. The glory of the heavenly and earthly bodies vary also the amount of light that they give off, how well they can be seen. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. When he says spiritual body, he doesn't mean a ghost. He means that resurrected body. That's what he's referring to. The contrasts are wonderful. We're going to go from perishable, dishonor, weak, and natural to imperishable, glorified, and spiritual. Verse 45, so also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So Paul is quoting from the creation account, which is Genesis 2, verse 7, then Yahweh Adonai formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now Paul continues his contrasting here between this earthly body and that resurrected spiritual body like the one of Messiah. Adam became a living soul while Yeshua became a life-giving breath. Verse 46, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from earth, earthy. The second man is from, from the heavenlies. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. See, the natural or earthly body has to take place first. Then the heavenly body will bear the image of the heavenly. Verse 50, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. You see, what we are right now, we cannot inherit that eternal kingdom. Okay, we can't do it. We can't do it. Flesh and blood perish. But you see, that kingdom is imperishable. The kingdom will never perish when, it, when, it, when it's consummated here. We read in 1 Samuel 13, verse 13, And Samuel said to Saul, You've acted foolishly. You've not kept the commandment of Yahweh, your Elohim, which he commanded you. For now Yahweh would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. 2 Samuel 7, 13, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 2 Samuel 7, 16, And your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. 1 uh, Chronicles 17, 14, I'll settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Daniel 2, verse 44, And in, those, uh, in the days of those kings, the Elohim of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Daniel 7, 18, But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. If the kingdom is forever and imperishable, in order for us to inherit it, how, how must we be? imperishable, have to be, or else it doesn't work. The promise doesn't, doesn't apply. Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's saying not everyone who's a part of the kingdom will die. Many people of Israel will be alive when he returns, and they'll receive glorified bodies at his return. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, 
For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. <clears throat> when the resurrection happens, the dead will be raised again, or raised up with immortal or imperishable bodies. That's necessary because the kingdom is imperishable. Verse 54. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Paul quotes Isaiah and Hosea in their descriptions of the resurrection. In Isaiah 25, verse 8, he'll swallow up death for all time. And Adonai Yahweh will wipe tears away from all faces. He'll remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for Yahweh has spoken. And Hosea 13, 14, Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O death, where are your thorns? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion will be hidden from my sight. And he, Paul plucked that phrase out of a, a condemnation of the northern kingdom. Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the Torah. Sin has power because of the curses given in Torah for disobedience. Okay? That's the power of sin. It's the curses of the Torah. Verses 57 and 58. But thanks be to Elohim, who gives us the victory through our master Yeshua Messiah. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the master, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the master. You see, Paul writes that we have victory because of the resurrection of Yeshua Messiah. All our work for Elohim is not in vain because the resurrection of Yeshua is certain and it's true. Therefore, our resurrection is the same way. It's certain, it's true, it's not, it's not a hope you can't, that a hope. The term that is used in scripture is a hope. The term should be translated better as expectation. You should expect it, okay? You should expect it. Any questions, any thoughts on 1 Corinthians 15? I love that chapter. Paul makes so much sense. So much sense. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we should expect it. Can it's going to happen, yes. It's going to happen. Everything else he said that was going to happen, happened. Everything. You see, and even in the Tanakh, you see that the kingdom is going to be forever. How many times? I just picked a few out, five or six places. And then he says how we're going to be forever. And death is going to be gone. No more pain, no more sorrow. But you see, everything had to happen in order. That's what, you know, we're, why, why is he waiting so long to come back? But you know what? If he hadn't wait, waited at least this long... There's a lot of people that wouldn't, wouldn't be in that kingdom, okay? So we need to be grateful that he has waited. And we just need to wait on his time, all right? It's his time. <clears throat> See, but first, the first fruits had to take place. The first fruits of the resurrection had to take place. Then, after that, the harvest is going to take place. We just don't know when that is going to happen. I just think it's going to be fairly soon. Any... Uh, Anybody else? Gathering all of his people. What's that? Gathering all of his people. Gathering, yeah, he's got to gather all his people. That's right. That's right. And it's going to be, he said, at that last trump, at the, at the last trumpet. And I think it's Feast of Trumpets. I'm just pretty sure that's what he's referring to. He's referring to these other feasts. I think he's saying that's the Feast of Trumpets. That's going to happen. So we'll see. Okay, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we. Uh, we thank you for, uh, for your word um, and also how the, uh, the Apostle Paul could be such an encouragement to us. We also uh, are, are greatly uh, blessed by the things that you've written, uh, written for us about your people, how they've suffered and, and also been disobedient, gone against you and also for you. And these are things that we are to learn from. 
that we should take heed and take to our heart. And may Yahweh bless us and keep us. And may Yahweh make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And may Yahweh lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen.